Good morning, and welcome to this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. There is one item on the agenda for today. CPSC staff will brief the Commission this morning on a draft final rule which would establish a safety standard for magnet sets. The CPSC staff who will be briefing us this morning are Mr. Andrew Cameros from the Office of the Attorney General and Dr. Jonathan Midget, Children's Hazard Team Leader in the Office of Hazard Identification and Reduction. Before asking Mr. Cameros to begin, however, I've been asked by Commissioner <laughs> Anne-Marie Burkle, who is not joining us today, to read a brief note from her. Open quote. I have decided that I will not participate in today's commission meeting or vote on the final rule for magnet sets. The mandatory standard being considered would apply to the same <laughs> magnet sets that are subject of a pending CPSC administrative case, which is scheduled for trial in December. Since the commission may be called upon to review the administrative law judge's decision in that case, I do not think it is appropriate for me to vote on a standard addressing the same magnet sets at this time. I appreciate the chairman's allowing the statement to be read. Closed quote. And now, Mr. Cameros, if you could please begin the staff briefing. Uh, thank you, Chairman, Commissioners. Good morning. Uh, the purpose of this meeting is for staff to discuss uh, the information and analysis underlying its recommendation that the Commission issue a safety standard for magnet sets under Section 7 and Section 9 of the CPSA. CPSA. Section 7 of the CPSA authorizes the Commission to issue consumer product safety standards that consist of performance requirements and or requirements for warnings or instructions. The requirements that are issued under Section 7 must be reasonably necessary to prevent or reduce an unreasonable risk of injury associated with the product. <clears throat> Section 9 of the CPSA sets forth the process to be followed uh, in issuing a consumer product safety standard. The Commission has the option of starting the rulemaking uh, process by the issuance of an advance notice of proposed rulemaking or a notice of propose, proposed rulemaking. In this instance, the Commission chose to, to begin with a notice of propose, proposed rulemaking that was published in the Federal Register on September 4th of 2012. Uh, the NPR that was published included the text of the proposed regulation, a preliminary regulatory analysis, uh, an initial regulatory flexibility analysis, and a request for comments from the public. Uh, Section 9 also requires the Commission to provide an opportunity for the public to make oral presentations regarding the subject matter of the proposed rule, and uh, to that end, a public hearing was held here at headquarters on October uh, 22nd of 2013, and um, there were several participants who uh, made statements and presented information relevant to the proposed rule. Section 9 requires that the, the rule include a, a final regulatory analysis. Um, the regulatory analysis has to include a description of the potential benefits and costs of, of the rule, uh, a description of alternatives that the Commission has considered to the rule that, is, um, that has been proposed, and a summary of significant issues raised by comments on the preliminary regulatory analysis. Section 9 also sets forth the findings um, uh, that the Commission must make to, to issue the final rule. Um, the Commission must make appropriate findings regarding the degree and nature of the risk intended to be addressed by the rule, the approximate number of products subject to the rule, the need of the public and effect of the rule on the utility, cost, and availability of the product, and other means of achieving the objective of the rule while minimizing adverse effects on competition. Finally, Section 9 provides that the Commission shall not issue uh, the rule, the draft final rule, unless it makes the following findings. Um, that the rule is reasonably necessary to reduce an unreasonable risk of injury. That the rule is in the public interest that if there is a voluntary standard that addresses uh, the product and the risk of injury, compliance with that voluntary standard is not likely to result 
uh, in an adequate reduction of the injuries or that substantial compliance with the voluntary standard is unlikely. In this instance, as, as stated in the briefing package, there is no voluntary standard for um, magnet sets as, as they're defined in the draft uh, final rule. Um, the Commission also must make findings regarding the uh, expected benefits uh, of the rule and that those bear a reasonable relationship to its costs and that the rule imposes the least burdensome requirement that prevents or adequately reduces the risk of injury. Uh, Jonathan Midget will now discuss the information and analysis that is contained in the briefing package that was presented to the Commission um, last week that underlies the staff's recommendation that the Commission issue the draft safety standard for magnet sets. I'm going to review what was mentioned in the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. Specifically, let's start with what the product is itself. We have uh, aggregated masses of strong, powerful magnets that are marketed as sculptures, sculpture construction toys, puzzles, stress relievers. They're commonly sold in sets of 125 to 216, but some sets have as many as 1,000 spheres in the set. Most of them are four millimeters to six millimeter spheres, but other uh, shapes have been marketed such as cubes, a mass of cubes. Some of the products are labeled for users 14 years old and up. Some say for adults only. Some bear no uh, age labeling at all. The magnets are powerful. They're many times the attraction force allowed by the toy standard. Uh, these are very, very strong magnets. Uh, this rule uh, would apply to all magnet sets that fall into the definition as <coughs> stated in the, in the rule, whether they're marketed to adults or children as toys or not. <coughs> the uh, products are primarily manufactured overseas and approximately 2.7 million sets have been sold during the time of the economic analysis. That's from 2009 through mid-2012. Uh, current sales are dramatically lower than when they were prior to CP CPSC enforcement actions. Uh, probably due to the actions themselves. The retail prices of these sets typically range from 20 to $45, the average about 25. Now I'd like to discuss the uh, National Electronic Injury Surveillance System estimates <clears throat> of injuries associated with these products. Uh, this is likely an undercount of the true total number of incidents, but from, from January of 2009 to December of 2013, uh, there are estimated about 580 cases per year associated with these products. And there's an estimated 7,700 cases of emergency department treated ingestions involving magnets, type unknown or other type of magnets for that same period. Most of that estimate is associated with magnets of an unknown type. And it is possible that if more information were available on those cases, some portion of them would be identified as involving magnet sets themselves. <clears throat> uh, since the NPR now, uh, there's been no statistically significant change in these numbers, but these products do produce severe injuries. Uh, and I just want to briefly mention the types of injuries these are associated with. Uh, pressure necrosis, which is caused by a clamping of the magnets on either side of some part of the gastrointestinal tract, which causes the cells in that place to, to die. Uh, perforations of the intestine, uh, fistulas, uh, gastrointestinal obstructions, uh, twisting of the intestines called volvulus, uh, and these problems can lead to infection, peritonitis, sepsis, and death. There are acute and long-term health effects such as gastrointestinal bleeding, uh, leakage, uh, uh, rupture of the intestines, infection, temporary paralysis of the normal contractions in the intestine, the victims may need a feeding tube, they may need, need intravenous feeding, and they may need a colostomy bag. There's comp compromised digestive function and nutrition accompanied by diarrhea, cramps, and malabsorption of food. There can be scar tissue and adhesions in the intestines which compromise GI functions, may require future surgeries, and in girls, the scar, scar tissue associated with these injuries can affect their ability to have children in the future. And associated with all of these injury patterns, there's the elevated uh, adverse health effects associated with multiple x-rays. We have uh, data available to us that comes through uh, other avenues besides the National Electronic Injury Surveillance System. We call these non-NICE data. 
in, in the cases reported to the CPSC, we have <clears throat> magnet-related ingestions for this time period from 2009 to uh, 2014, 100 reported cases classified as magnet sets or possibly being magnet sets. The most commonly reported age group is the 4 to 12-year-old age category. This is no different than what was reported in the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. <clears throat> but now we also have to add to the record one death. A 19-month-old child <clears throat> uh, died from ischemic bowel due to magnets. The victim had been diagnosed at an urgent care facility as having a probable virus the day before her death. The me medical examiner described the seven magnets which were found in the child's small intestine as spheres which are 0.5 centimeters in diameter and, quote, very magnetic. <clears throat> Staff believes the magnets involved in this case came from a magnet set based on the review of the recovered magnets. <clears throat> so just to summarize, <clears throat> we have a, a vulnerable population at risk with a, an injury mechanism that's very difficult for parents to foresee. The diagnosis is very difficult for the medical community. The severity of the injuries is extremely high, and there are acute long-term health effects associated with those injuries. So, in light of these facts, we have proposed a rule with limited scope. The magnets uh, covered by the proposed rule are intended for specific purposes. Many of the commenters on our proposed rule misunderstood this. They thought we were trying to regulate all magnets. This is not all magnets. This is magnet sets, sets of magnets. And the requirements that we proposed are based on the ASTM F963 toy standard. <clears throat> there are essentially two avenues. One is to limit the size of the magnets so the magnets cannot be so, so large and they must not fit in the small part cylinder, which is a well-established well and readily available tool. Or the magnets must be of a weaker strength. The strength must not uh, exceed 50 kilogauss squared millimeters squared. So <clears throat> after proposing this rule, we have had the opportunity for, public, for the public to submit comments. And we had a public hearing, as uh, my colleague mentioned earlier, in October of last year. Uh, in addition to the public hearing, we received more than 5,000 comments from the public on this issue. Uh, staff coded the public comments into about 30 different categories as a team. There were uh, highly repetitive comments, but uh, there were some in support of the rule and some in opposition to the rule. And we responded to those arguments, all of them, uh, collectively in the briefing package which you have, uh, whether the argument was made by one consumer or by hundreds of consumers. Everyone has a voice. And in the staff, uh, staff's opinion, none of the comments provided any new information that would, would require significant changes to the proposed rule. I will summarize some of the comments for you. In general, we, we received many comments about the utility of the subject products. Uh, consumers opposed to the rule likened magnet sets to science kits, therape therapeutic aids for stress relief, concentration aids for people with ADHD, and as a bona fide artistic medium. Essentially, they believe in these comments that their, the product's value exceeds the cost to society of the injuries. Supporters of the proposed rule called the magnet sets novelties and distractions that have many other alternatives and therefore what little value they offer to society is easily replaced or substituted by other things. We received a number of comments about impacts on businesses, especially the potential loss of jobs and perhaps the creation of a black market for magnet sets after the regulation was passed. Some people commented on our risk analysis. They believe that uh, other products have higher injury rates. And there were many uh, uh, comparisons to other products on the market, such as balloons, uh, trampolines, and household chemicals are brought up many times, but, but there, were, there were dozens of different types of product categories mentioned in comparison. Um, some commenters say that ingesting the magnets is an unreasonable misuse, and mag manufacturers shouldn't be responsible for that. And, and other people in support of the rule said that ingestion is a foreseeable misuse of these products, and, and manufacturers should know about it. 
We received numerous comments about the warnings, uh, both, both for and against. Some people said that the warnings currently were sufficient, others said they were insufficient, and some people said, well, what's there could be improved, so more warnings are what we really need. Uh, many comments mentioned warnings. A number of comments mentioned parenting and the responsibility of caregivers in injury prevention in general and the role of supervision but people in support of the rule also noted the obscure nature of the danger and, and doubted whether parents actually could adequately supervise uh, a house containing such products. A number of comments were received about injury prevention. People mentioned child-resistant packaging could be a possible alternative, or the use of bitterants, which are chemicals embedded on the surface of uh, a magnet set or any product in general. Bitterants are supposed to deter ingestion because they make the product taste bad. Some people argued that public education is all that's warranted and we shouldn't do anything more, and some people suggested limiting sales to adults. There were a number of opinions of the medical community summarized in your briefing package as well. Uh, most medical represented, representatives of the medical community cited the severity of the injuries and the long-term effects. Uh, and at least one commenter requested a, re a revision of the flux index based on better anatomical data. There were some engineering issues covered. Uh, people questioned the capabilities of magnet sets uh, or what a magnet set would look like with a flux index, index lower than 50. They questioned whether it would be useful for anything. Some people uh, questioned the effectiveness of the flux index limit for limiting uh, the, the injury mechanism. And some people noted problems with measuring flux index and these issues are, are, have been answered by our engineers uh, in the briefing package. We received a lot of comments about the rulemaking process itself and comments on government in general and how government should operate, how it should work. People discussed the scope of the proposed rule and felt it was too broad, too broadly worded. They discussed the rate of injury and felt like the injuries were not sufficient enough to warrant a rulemaking. They questioned the commission's authority to regulate the products at all. They made many comparisons to other products and questioned the rulemaking procedures and the sections of uh, the law that were being used to promulgate the rule. Many people said that the magnet sets are not defective, they're acting just as they're supposed to and therefore should not be regulated. Uh, there was many uh, accusations that the rule was arbitrary and should not proceed on that basis. And people in support of the rule cited many, many times that the product has low utility but very high severity injuries and so those two things uh, counterbalance one another and they believe that the rule should move forward to prevent these injuries. So in light of all those comments, we, we are still uh, of the mind to recommend a draft final rule. And so we have made a few changes, uh, clarifications and, and improvements of the, the definition that was in the NPR. The definition of the magnet set is now as I've shown on the screen and I'll read it in part. A magnet set is any aggregation of separable magnetic objects that is a consumer product intended, marketed, or commonly used as a manipulative or construction item for entertainment such as puzzle working, sculpture building, mental stimulation, or stress relief. And that's the current proposal for the draft final rule. The, the definition of uh, an individual magnet was also added to the rule, uh, and the definition is uh, let me read that. Quote, an individual magnetic object intended or marketed for use with or as a magnet set as defined in paragraph B of the defined rule. So individual magnet is now defined. Uh, we also modified the definition of magnet set from the NPR's wording to remove the word permanent. It was felt that uh, that wasn't needed in the definition. And we replaced a phrase intended or marketed by the manufacturer primarily with the phrase intended, marketed, or commonly used. And that was felt that that would uh, prevent people from labeling their product out of the scope of the rule and not needing to comply with it by just slapping a label on it. We replaced the phrase desk toy with the, the word item. It was felt that desk toy never really properly captured the product category as a whole and the word item is more general. And the, the uh, scope now specifies factors that could indicate whether a magnet set meets the definition. And these were, were added to help uh, manufacturers and retailers understand when their products fall in the scope. And I have a slide to uh, 
unpack that, those factors. Uh, basically, these factors come from well-established uh, regulations, specifically the small parts regulation. It's, it's not an exact quote from that rule, but it, it, it mimics it very closely. So the Office of Compliance will take into account manufacturer's stated intent if it's a reasonable one, the advertising, promotion, marketing, packaging, and, or display of the product, and the uses for which the product is commonly recognized by consumers. And this language is, is similar to our small parts rule. Uh, the requirements for the final rule are simply stated, and, and this is a, an exact quote. Each magnet in a magnet set and any individual magnet that fits completely within the cylinders described in 16 CFR 1501.4, which is our small part cylinder, must have a flex, flux index of 50 kilogauss squared millimeter squared or less when tested in accordance with the method described in section 1240.4. So the flux index was developed, as I mentioned, by the ASTM F963 toy standard, and that's the, the, the test that's mentioned here, described in 1240.4. It replicates the toy standards method. Staff uh, is required to consider alternatives to rulemaking, and, and here's a list of the different alternatives that were considered and are described in detail in the tabs of, of your briefing package. Different performance requirements were considered safer packaging, warnings and labels, restrictions on sales and corrective actions, and of course the option to do nothing. In the final regulatory analysis, uh, we need to explain that the baseline for the benefit cost measurement uh, is perhaps slightly different than the normal course of events. The, the benefits and costs are estimated relative to the state of the market prior to compliance enforcement actions reason this was done was because there was a severe drop-off in the, the sales when uh, the compliance uh, activities began. The choice of the baseline assumes that without the rule, the market could revert to prior status due to consumer demand and ease of market entry. It's very easy for someone to repackage bulk magnets and sell them as a magnet set. The benefits of the rule uh, come from the injury cost model, and this is uh, the usual uh, economic analysis. They're measured as a reduction in societal costs of injuries attributed to the rule, such as medical costs, work loss, estimates, and intangible costs of pain and suffering. And there's no deviation from the usual um, course of economic analysis. The annual benefits for this rule have been estimated to be about $29 million relative to the baseline. The costs of the rule are measured as lost producer surplus and lost consumer utility. There is as much as $6 million in lost producer surplus, but the value of lost utility cannot be measured using available data, so it's unknown. We're required to consider the regulatory flexibility analysis, the impacts on small business and businesses. So since the publication of our NPR and the compliance actions began, 12 importers stopped selling magnet sets, and sales of the magnet sets have dropped dramatically. One major firm, note that it's a major firm, still sells magnets, and they sell only magnet sets, no other products that we know of. The final rule will likely have a significant adverse impact on the one remaining major firm, but I should note here that several uh, smaller firms still remain, and that it seems very easy to enter this market, especially using online retailing. Established sellers can easily purchase magnetic spheres and package them as a magnet set as defined. Uh, and the Office of Compliance has witnessed smaller firms coming into and going out of the market uh, pretty easily. So allow me to summarize then. We have a vulnerable population experiencing high severity injuries that are hard to diagnose and treat. The hazard is not intuitive, not well known, easily misdiagnosed, and there therefore constitutes a hidden hazard. The injury mechanism is complex and not intuitive and does not lend itself to pre prevention strategies that rely on warning labels. Note, I'm not saying that warnings in general are ineffective. I'm saying warnings are ineffective in this case for this product category. The draft rule has an extremely limited scope that uh, should minimize the risks associated with magnet sets as defined and should not affect magnets used for other purposes. So uh, 
BAF also has re, uh, uh, done the, the requisite cost-benefit analysis and found that the benefits to society are likely to be greater than the costs. So bearing uh, all those facts in mind, uh, staff recommends a rule based on the performance requirements of the TOY standard that address magnet-related injuries with an effective date 180 days after publication in the Federal Register. So that concludes my presentation, and we're certainly open for questions. Thank you, Dr. Midget. Thank you, Mr. Camaros. We're now going to move to the phase of the briefing where the commissioners can ask questions. Each commissioner will be entitled to 10 minutes, and we'll have as many rounds as necessary as questions are needed to be asked. I'm going to go ahead and start. And Dr. Midget, you obviously talked at the beginning and then again at the end about the injuries associated with the hazard from a lay person's perspective, if you can start from the beginning, whether you're talking about a young child or a teenager, one, what are they feeling internally? Two, how do these symptoms present to a caregiver and then to, a, if, assuming they get medical attention, as you would hope they would, to a medical provider? What's actually happening in lay terms inside the body? And then once there is medical intervention, what kind of intervention is there? And then long-term, what's actually going to be going on with that person's body and the type of care that they're going to continue to need. And of course, if you need to ask anybody else on staff to assist with you at the table, please go ahead. I think that's an, an interesting question because you're getting into uh, the, what's happening in the, the family home and how children are coming into contact with these products. We know from injury uh, reports that uh, sometimes uh, these products are, are purchased for the victim and given to them by their caregivers. Sometimes the children come into contact with them at school or through their friends who, who hand out parts of their own set to their friends to play with because if you have 216, you're not going to miss a few, a handful here or there. Uh, so there are uh, a significant number of families coming into contact with these products. They never bought them. They never saw the packaging. They didn't even know what they were. The children just end up having them. Um, and these products, being magnetic, can behave in very unpredictable ways, especially for children who don't have a, a great deal of uh, experience using these things. They end up stuck to belt buckles and, and, and backpacks, and they find their way all throughout the house because they're magnetic. They hitch a ride. So they could end up anywhere. Uh, and this containment issue is very difficult for parents to stay on top of, if not impossible. Even people who are trying to keep all of their magnets set together as one coherent unit are losing magnets. We know that because there's manufacturers who are selling them singly as replacements. So they're, they're losing track of these products. So where are they going to end up? They're going to end up all over the house, in the carpet, in the rugs, and that's where children are spending lots of time playing. And then when they come across them, they look uh, sometimes like candy, and uh, there are candies out there that are suspiciously similar to magnet sets. Uh, and, but even if they didn't look like candy, even if they looked nothing like candy, children of those young ages put everything in their mouth, and the likelihood of swallowing them is quite high once they get a hold of them. Uh, so the caregivers are, are, are facing an uphill battle to monitor the existence of these things in their home and to monitor their whereabouts at all times. It's very difficult to supervise that kind of a hazard. Um, as far as what happens if a child ingests them, I, I think maybe the easiest thing to do would be to um, uh, read uh, an account from the NPR which had the uh, accounts of many different incidents from our in-depth investigations. And, and I will choose the one which I think is, well, maybe I can read two here. Um, here here's one where a 10-year-old girl was simulating a tongue piercing. She accidentally swallowed two small magnetic balls. The same day, her mother took her to the local emergency room, and she was admitted for five days, during which time the movement of the magnets was monitored by 10 x-rays, three CT scans, and an endoscopy. So five days of hospitalization. Ultimately, the magnets were manipulated uh, from their eventual position in the colon into the appendix via laparoscopic surgery and then removed by an appendectomy. There's no indication that uh, uh, she, she had a perforation, and reportedly the total medical costs incurred during the child's, the, the girl's treatment exceeded $22,000. Um, uh, 
let me select uh, another one that was a famous case. A 23-month-old male ingested eight small spherical magnets from a product described as a magnetic puzzle. He started vomiting overnight and worsened the next day. As a result, he was taken to an urgent care facility where a bilateral ear infection initially was suspected. Uh, this sometimes looks like something very different, an ear infection. A few hours later, as the child's condition worsened and he lost consciousness intermittently, an abdominal x-ray indicated six small balls that his mother recognized immediately and informed the staff were magnets from the puzzle. He was transferred to a children's hospital where subsequent x-ray revealed some slight movement. And according to the mother, the doctors thought the magnets would pass naturally. An x-ray taken the following day showed the magnets were located between the small and large intestine. Therefore, surgery was undertaken to remove them. During surgery, two, small, two balls were found in the small intestine and six were found outside the bowel in the abdominal cavity. These were removed and a small intestine, intestinal perforation was repaired. Um, the child underwent several sequential surgeries over the, the next 10 days to repair leaks. It's unclear if this involved misperforations or failure of repairs or new perforations. Uh, they treated a blood clot ischemic necrotic bowel, which is essentially dead tissue that had lost blood flow, and serious infection stemming from the initial magnetic injury. Ultimately, after what appears to be at least five or six operations, the child was stabilized and was still in intensive care unit for more than a month, having lost all but 10 to 15 centimeters of his small intestine. He lost all but 10 to 15 centimeters of his small intestine. The small intestine is usually about 600 to 700 centimeters long, according to HS staff. Uh, the boy is being fed intravenously and has a colostomy bag to remove waste products. He will require a bowel transplant, and his long-term prognosis is poor. Staff notes, this is HF staff, staff notes that this case recently has been reported in the medical literature and also reported on a podcast at the website of the North American Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition. So. Uh, this is a, a famous case where a child basically lost the vast majority of his intestines. Uh, so he's still uh, undoubtedly going to undergo treatment, and, th and this, this injury is going to affect him for his entire life. Now, I could go on. There are more interesting cases from a physiological standpoint, but basically uh, these are terrible injuries, and I'll leave it at that. And Dr. Midget, in, in your estimation, what is distinguishing about this product or these products that end up with that kind of medical result as opposed to something that is similarly sized or shaped that is swallowed by a child that a medical professional might actually recommend waiting for that to pass? Well, it's the, the magnetic uh, attraction force. If, if a magnet is on one side of uh, one curve of the intestines and on the other side, they can attract together over several centimeters, even if they were lying on the desk here. They, they have such strong forces. So once they're in proximity in the intestines, they clamp together. And people don't think of that. It's hard to foresee that injury mechanism. So if your child swallows a magnet, you might not think anything of it. Uh, and if they swallowed another one, you might not think anything of it. Because you don't picture magnets being able to attract through parts of the body. But once they're affixed, they're most likely going to stay there until they pull through because it's such a powerful a a attraction. Our final rule limits the flux index to 50, but these products have m many times higher the magnetic strength. They're in the hundreds of flux. Thank you, Dr. Midget. Commissioner Adler? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for an excellent presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, before I ask any questions, I did want to respond to my colleague, Commissioner Burkle's absence at the meeting. She is an extremely thoughtful uh, and reasonable person, and the fact that she's not appeared shows that she has some serious concerns. So I will say for myself, I miss her wisdom, I miss her good cheer, but I don't want to let her comments go unaddressed because I disagree with them. So I'm going to make some general comments, not necessarily related to the specifics of the magnet vote, because I don't have the magnet case before me yet. Uh, it is correct to note that the Commission is about to vote on a consumer product safety standard. That's what we're doing today. At the same time, the Commission uh, has an administrative proceeding before an administrative law judge, specifically with respect to the same product. Um, 
And in my view, that is completely appropriate, consistent with our statute, and with current administrative pr practice throughout the government. The two proceedings involve different purposes, different law, and different issues. So again, speaking generally, go back to the day when the co Congress passed the Consumer Product Safety Act. They wanted us to be able to address dangerous products in comprehensive fashion. So first they said, we want you to be able to write safety rules and safety standards. Uh, but they put a provision in, it's section 9G1 of the Consumer Product Safety Act, and it says, when you write a safety standard, you can't touch products that are already in the marketplace. And the theory seems to be it's not fair to address products in a safety standard that when they were produced, the safety standard wasn't in effect, and so they were perfectly legal. But Congress didn't want us to leave, to leave us without the ability to go after products in the marketplace if they're particularly dangerous. So they set up a different procedure in Section 12 and Section 15, in which they said, if you encounter a product that is particularly dangerous, we apply a different standard, but we will authorize you to go against those products. So they've allowed us to go after products with respect to the future, and with a different set of issues, different law, they've given us the authority to go after products that are currently in the marketplace. But if you look at Section 15, it says, you c it's not enough to prove that a product violates a consumer product safety standard. That won't get you relief under Section 15. You actually have to prove that the violation of the safety standard presents a substantial product hazard. So it's a different and it's a more stringent uh, standard for us to meet, and that's what's being litigated, uh, or the, the likelihood of it being a defect, because again, we don't have a safety standard into effect. I'm not passing judgment on the administrative proceeding. But my point is that there is no due process violation and no impropriety in the two proceedings. Uh, anybody who's involved in the development of the safety standard has the full ability to submit written comments, to participate in an oral proceeding, and to bring uh, a challenge to the safety standard in court if they wish. Similarly, a party that's facing administrative litigation has the full range of due process rights granted under Section 554 of the Administrative Procedure Act and Section 15F1 of the Consumer Product Safety Act, meaning they have the full panoply of rights that any respondent would have and the right to challenge that case in court. Uh, and that's similar to uh, the authority at most agencies. Uh, and I don't know of a single case that has found those two procedures to be inappropriate or illegal, and there have been a number of challenges. But she does raise an issue that I have to admit I've always been perplexed by, and that is uh, I remember when I first came to the commission and the general counsel explained to us how administrative cases are handled. First, they come to the commissioners and they say, we want you to make a preliminary determination that this product might present a substantial product hazard. Let us go and bring administrative proceeding. Then, after the administrative proceeding, guess who hears the appeal? We do. And so that's always struck me as a bit anomalous, but that is something, if ever there were an issue that's been litigated to the Supreme Court, in which the Supreme Court has said, uh, as with most other agencies, that's the way the administrative procedure operates with respect to administrative litigation. It still feels a little bit strange to me, and the way I've coped with it is once we have cast a vote to initiate a case, I don't follow it at all. I don't read newspaper stories about it. Uh, I don't read the pleadings, even if they're public. I want that to be, at least in my case, a mental firewall between uh, our initiation of the case and when the case comes to us. And I think that uh, that permits us to provide a full and fair and pristine procedure for people. I mention that just because I see that that seems to commi uh, concern Commissioner Burkle. It's not an unreasonable concern, but I think it's a concern that long ago has been laid to rest. So with that, I'd like to ask a question of Dr. Midget, if I might. Um, and uh, I note that we set a flux index of 50, and we've gotten that from ASTM. Uh, and I guess my question, um, and this is just my sort of fly-specking what we've done, I wonder if we ever decided at some point just to get some animal tissue 
take two <coughs> magnets that have a flux of 50 and see if they tracked each other through the tissue. In other words, we're looking at the empirical data, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to do, but it does make me nervous that, at least as I understand it, nobody's ever sat down and taken two magnets with a flux of 50 and seen what the effect is on animal tissue, or maybe we've done that. Do you happen to know if we've ever done anything like that? Well, I don't know that we ever used animal tissue, but we did consider the lower bound limit when ASTM was developing the flux index to use in the toy standard. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we fully admit, and we're on the record saying to them, that it is possible for a, a magnet with a flux index of 50 to potentially attract across tissues. But the, f the magnetic field of a, of a flux index of 50 magnet is very small, so mm -hmm. the magnets have to get much closer together than they do in the regular magnet sets. Uh, and to be able to tell just that they uh, will attach isn't enough to answer the question. Then you need to know, could the normal contractions of the intestine <coughs> pull them apart again? It, might, it may be that they will attract and find each other in the intestines, but then the course of normal anatomical motions We'll, we'll open, <laughs> we'll, we'll pull them apart again, and uh -huh. they'll keep going through. So uh, to do that kind of study really would require a live intestine. So you'd have to do, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't do human subject testing. You'd probably have to go to animal testing, live sheep. And we actually looked into how much it would cost to do live animal testing with sheep or pigs or something like that. And it's a very expensive study. So I gather, and by the way, I hereby uh, refuse to volunteer yeah. to help you yeah. in a study like that. Right. But thank you for putting that in context. That certainly helps. And I'm not saying that the uh, establishment of 50 flux uh, is inappropriate or unreasonable. It's just one that I was curious about the degree of certainty we have about that. Um, I did also want to ask uh, Mr. Cameros, um, I noticed that we don't in the standard uh, have any certification requirements with respect to a general uh, conformity certificate, but it is our position that uh, anybody that might be making a uh, magnet set where they say it's, it, it would meet our standard, they would be obligated to certify that uh, that, that has passed a reasonable testing program. I, am I correct in saying that? I, b I believe that's correct. And the only reason I raise it is that, at least historically, when we wrote safety standards, we put provisions in the safety standard relating to certification. Now, it may have been that since the Consumer Product Safety <laughs> Improvement Act mandated uh, GCCs that we don't have to put it in. And so maybe that is the, uh, that's the reason it's not there, but I just noticed it wasn't there. I also noticed something else that wasn't there, and that is, uh, in other standards, we've put in what I would term as anti-stockpiling provisions, which says if you're a manufacturer, you can't suddenly produce gobs and gobs of stuff for inventory that you would then sell and which would be legal uh, and therefore would potentially flood the market, at least for a period of time. Uh, is there a particular reason that we didn't do stockpiling language in this safety standard? I think I know the answer, but I'd be curious what your thought was. Uh, to be honest, I don't, I don't recall ever actually considering that um, in the course of the work that was done in, in drafting the, the regulatory text. Well, my guess was that we looked at what was actually taking place in the market and we said there's, there's not enough production there so that stockpiling would present a hazard and maybe it's more of an academic concern, but uh, I, I just wondered why we didn't have any language in there for stockpiling. Uh, I think I will stop my questions at this point, and I thank you. I do have a few future questions. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I also would like to start by just commenting on Commissioner Burkle's decision not to participate today and say how disappointed I am in that. Um, after I received her email yesterday saying she was not going to participate, I also reviewed our statute carefully and our vote, our decision to vote on the notice of proposed rulemaking and our final rulemaking package, and I won't reiterate what Commissioner Adler so ably um, explained as to why this is a perfectly appropriate proceeding. I just would like to add that I think that her decision not to participate um, uh, is, a, is a troubling precedent. 
um, because I think if we communicate to the regulated community that all it takes is litigation to make us halt rulemaking, no matter how dangerous a product might be, that we're sending a, a troubling message. Um, and on a more pleasant note, I would like to just take a moment to introduce a new member of my staff, Boaz Green, who's sitting right behind me. Uh, Mr. Green is coming to us from the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, um, where he was a trial attorney for four years, and before that he was an associate at Dewey LaBeouf for five years, and um, that's after graduating from NYU summa cum laude and Georgetown University Law Center cum laude in 2005. And I also just have to add that um, in a previous life, he was a commander in the Israeli Defense Forces for tank commanders. So. Um, He's going to take care of us. <laughs> Welcome, Boaz. Um, and I would just like to thank not only Mr. Carneros and Dr. Midget for your wonderful presentation, but this package was really incredibly well prepared. And there were obviously so many parts of our agency that came together to put this package together. And I really want to thank all of you. Um, I think my first question is a quick one. And I don't know if either of you want to answer it or if you want to ask somebody from compliance. But you did mention, Dr. Um, Midget, about the fact that, that the numbers have fallen somewhat since our compliance actions, and uh, we've had two recent settlements we know of. And I guess I would like to know if um, what compliance is, or, or your opinion is, uh, with respect to whether this has, our compliance actions have had enough of an effect that this rulemaking um, procedure it may not be necessary. Actually, when we practiced for this presentation, that came up, and the Office of Compliance Personnel did mention to me to make you aware of the fact that it's easy to enter this market. And uh, so the Office of Compliance is not comfortable uh, saying that we've done enough, because anybody can start selling these pretty easily. Uh, so they see small firms uh, joining in all the time. So this rule still very much is needed. And I would just like to add that everyone in my office was very upset when we went online and tried to purchase them to see how easily um, you could get around this. So I applaud you for going forward with this rulemaking procedure. Um, I think what I'd like to just um, zoom in on uh, for a moment is with respect to the, the numbers that went into the cost-benefit analysis. And again, you may, I, I know we have our person here from epidemi epidemiology who actually went behind the numbers from our nice hospitals. And just for anyone who doesn't know, that's a r roughly 100 emergency rooms from which we gather our statistical data. And my understanding of how we came up with the final number that's somewhere around 28 million is we started with that nice data, um, went behind it in epidemiology, determined what of magnet swallowings um, were most likely, uh, had a high probability of being these high-powered magnets. And then we took that number and fed it into our uh, injury cost model. Uh, am I understanding that correctly? I believe that's an adequate summary. Okay, so what I'd like to do is just for a, just for a second, I'm not quite ready for econ, but I'd just like to ask a couple questions with respect to what went into the process of coming up with that estimate of 2,900 um, for the NICE numbers. and. Um, I, I know that the, the, the information was looked at with respect to the narratives, and these narratives are the actual medical records, as I understand it, um, that describe what someone's treatment is in an emergency department, obviously focusing on the medical treatment um, with some mentions from time to time of the cause. Is that fair to say? That's correct. And okay. it, it's not just uh, medical records, but we get nice reports specifically and with uh, very specific, limited information. And then with respect to looking at that information, um, what words were used to, I understand that there were different categories of these magnet, um, uh, that magnets that were involved in the injuries that resulted in somebody coming into the emergency department. And um, I, I think there were different descriptions, but I'd just like to know which words caused which um, of the treatments to go into which category? Okay, that's a very specific question. It is uh, addressed in the epidemiology tab of the briefing package, but I would uh, probably best defer to Sarah Garland, uh, who performed the analysis to describe those keywords. Okay, so the different categories, the yes possible group was, um, so in the NICE narrative, occasionally we get a, we hit a, 
great part where they, they've reported to us the a manufacturer or a model of a product. That there's no requirement to do that, but they occasionally, it does happen, so we can identify those exactly on what product was involved. But since that's not the normal, then um, going off of other keywords um, to create the yes possible category, basically if, if manufacturer was identified, okay, great, it's yes. But um, for all the rest, they were possibles. That So if they described it as a magnetic ball or um, a bead or a BB size magnet, or something so along those lines. I think that's, I don't know if that's the exhaustive list, but basically they had to give us some indication in that nice narrative that this thing was at least something in the, or very, the other one was a very magnetic, or very strong magnet that, and so they could be classified into the possible. It had to give some indication that the magnet wasn't just any old magnet out there that just giving us some indication that it might be coming from one of these magnet sets and it got into the possible group. That if it didn't give us any of those indications, then it went into um, an unknown group. If we had no way of telling what was happening, what kind of magnet was in there. If it described it as a kitchen magnet or an alphabet magnet, we knew absolutely that it was not something that we were interested in for categorizing here. Those were removed from the analysis altogether. Um, and then there, there were some other types of magnets that might be this type, but not in a magnet set. So they were classified as other. And so those are, so we have the group unknown, which is the majority of what's in there that most of the time they're just described as an unknown magnet. Or they're, they're just described as a magnet, so we just don't know what type they are. And so they got, those get classified into the unknown or other group. Okay, so could you just tell us what exactly was required for a for an injury to be put into the category of yes, probably high powered magnets? It identified a manufacturer that we were aware of that okay. manufactured. We've got these. the manufacturer, and then it had to say. Um, fair, let's see. Let's make sure I get the whole list. <laughs> we have a high powered, a magnetic ball, a marble a BB size magnet or magnetic bead, if they don't mention that it's jewelry. If it was mentioned as jewelry, then they get classified as other. But if it was magnetic bead without the jewelry context, then it was classified as possible. Possible. So which of those that you've just described ended up in the estimate of the 2900 as opposed to the 7700? So any of those that were, were classified as those were, are in the 2900. So anything that described the magnet. So it had to have a, a manufacturer or high-powered magnet. Or a ball, or a magnetic ball, or a magnetic bead, or BB okay. size magnet okay. description. And anything else would go into that 7700 because that's right. we weren't sure of it. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, and I have two minutes left, so maybe I can ask a real quick question of, um, of Econ. Um, and maybe you can answer this, Dr. Midget or Mr. Carneros as well. But I just wanted, when, when this 2900 number now was then fed into, my understanding is that it was fed into our injury cost model that has algorithms for certain categories of injuries. Do I understand that correctly? Okay. And the, the, algor the category of injury that we would use for this cost analysis, as I understand it, was any obj foreign object that swallowed? Yeah, our uh, estimates of injury costs are not product specific. They're diagnosis body part specific. Okay. So our estimate of what the cost would be for a particular injury, say a foreign uh, object in ingestion, which is what, this what most of the magnet injuries are coded as, uh, would be based on the types of uh, injuries that are found in the database. Okay. So magnets themselves would probably account for only a small proportion of the uh, foreign object ingestions. Okay, so this would also include objects that end up passing through. Yeah, it could, it could be batteries, okay. balloons, okay. coins, anything that uh, would be... A kid might swallow. Yeah, any, yeah, and anything that the hospital would code as a okay. just okay. for an object. And you you only use the numbers from the NICE data, the 2900 for your estimate, is that correct? Well, we use the I mean, as nice opposed to the uh, as opposed to the anecdotal information that yes, came from yes, other but, models. But I mean, we used more than just the nice estimates. We also uh, augmented the nice data by uh, 
the estimate, our estimate of injuries treated outside of emergency rooms. Right, uh, and that's part, part of the, the algorithm, that's right? That's part of the okay. uh, injury cost model. So in other words, and as I understand it, for example, the, the <coughs> 100 cases that are discussed in the briefing materials that were not part of, of the statistical data is not something we plug into our algorithm. Is that right? If, if epidemiology did not count it as okay. a likely uh, rare earth magnet injury, we wouldn't have included okay. it in the injury That's cost very model. helpful. Thank you so much. I'm, my time's up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Mohorovic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, the impact of this moment uh, is not missed on me, as I'm sure it's not missed on you, uh, being our first hearing. So first of all, I'd like to say uh, congratulations to you uh, on your leadership of the CPSC. Uh, I think you're off to a fantastic start. Uh, I would like to also thank uh, my fellow commissioners for really making me very welcome, as well as their staff and the entire uh, staff and safety community for helping me get my feet underneath me. So I hope you don't mind that small point of personal privilege. Uh, I think it's also uh, can't be said enough uh, the debt of gratitude the entire safety community has to offer to former Chairman Tenenbaum and for her stewardship through perhaps one of the most important periods of this agency's history, the CPSIA um, implementation. Uh, I often look at this period uh, in time right now and your new leadership as the post-CPSIA uh, implementation. So uh, a new man for new times, a new leadership, and I look forward to working with you moving forward. That brings us to the subject of the hearing today. Uh, I must say as an overview, the, in particular the latency, the severity of this particular product hazard has been one that's uh, always had significant impact and will continue to uh, be particular cause for alarm for me. Uh, Dr. Midget, Mr. Cameron, I want to thank you for a very effective overview and, and briefing, uh, as well as the entire staff who contributed to the accompanying documents and the staff briefing package. It's some excellent work. I do have some technical questions uh, that I'd like to get into. First of all, with regards to the uh, cost-benefit analysis work that was performed, um, I think some critics will look at government cost-benefit analysis and, and think that either the costs are overstated or understated and the benefits might be overstated or understated based on one's particular uh, position and how they view the rule. So I do think it's important uh, to give it a thor thorough review. Uh, I have done that as well and I have some questions and I'll, if you will, uh, I'll start on the benefit side. Um, and looking at the benefits that are indicated in the package, um, what gives me a little bit of pause is the consideration of 100 percent mitigation uh, by virtue of the potential impact of this rule. And I think 100 percent is always a tough number to achieve uh, no matter uh, what the chore is. Uh, could you mention in particular the, not how we got to the 29 million in, in estimated uh, potential benefits, but with regards to the potential mitigation and how um, we come to the conclusion that 100 percent of the, of the related uh, injuries uh, and, and how that number is, is forged uh, will be achieved. Uh, most rules that we uh, develop at CPSC <coughs> result in kind of mo modest safety improvements of, of products. Uh, typical examples are, are Section 104 nursery product rules. We take a product that exists, we make a few modifications to it to make it more safe, uh, and then it, it meets the standard, and presumably the injury rate is going to go down, but since the product's still there, you're still going to have injuries with the product. So you're going to have much less than 100% effectiveness of a, of a change in the standard. Uh, the magnet rule is different in the sense that we're eliminating mag these magnet sets from the marketplace. So by definition, to the extent that the rule is effective, all of the injuries involving these magnet sets would be prevented. And, and that's basically the difference. Good point. Um, I do agree that, uh, and, and I, I understand the scope and the potential impact of the rule, uh, however, the performance requirement being a flux indication does not necessarily eliminate small magnets. It may eliminate small high-powered magnets as defined by the performance standard, but getting to some of the other comments, 
of uh, my colleagues uh, on the commission here and looking at the, uh, the performance of the, the, the flux standard in particular. And, and I don't question uh, lending from the toy standard to look in that direction, uh, but potentially what we could still have out in the market is a small magnet uh, that, uh, that does perform to the standard and therefore is of a lower value, but the also the assumption in the report is that that would not result in any uh, related injuries. Well, of course, we, we always have these magnets under the toy standard, and so injuries involving magnets that satisfy the toy <laughs> standard may still exist and they may continue, but we're presuming in the analysis that we did that epidemiology gave to us just magnet injuries resulting from these rare earth, str very strong magnets. Uh, but of course, if other magnets are in use and children swallow them uh, and they go to the hospital, there will be some injuries, but not from the magnets that we're trying to address in the standard. Understood. And uh, if you could humor me a bit on the cost side uh, associated as well. Did I read correctly in the briefing package that there was an original estimation on the cost side that was above six million? The number that is in my head might be 7.5 on a previous draft. Is that correct? Uh, in the NPR, we used uh, slightly different sales estimates. We used better estimates in this analysis. Uh, in the earlier analysis, we had assumed sales were on the order of about a million a year. <clears throat> but we've kind of refined the data a little bit since the NPR, and it's more like about 800,000 a year. And, that's, and that, was, that was really why the, the difference uh, between the NPR and the uh, final rule analysis. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Um, I have some other questions uh, with regards to the use of lending, uh, of taking the ASTM standard. Um, from my previous position, um, uh, I was under the impression that the ASTM working group on magnets uh, was considering um, potentially a different uh, value for the performance standard. Uh, do we recognize that that's still a case and, and um, is it uh, of a high likelihood that the particular performance standard that we are, we are lending from might in fact uh, no longer be the case with the, with the toy standard? I'm not aware of that work or that suggestion. Okay. Not, not, I've never run across it. Very well. And we're sure that any, any of our staff that are, uh, that are contributing to that working group, um, it, it, they don't have any reason to believe that that performance standard is under reevaluation for a potentially better standard, whatever that may be. I'm not, I'm not sure, but that's something that was uh, in my mind. We're not aware of any work in that. I'll, I'll have right. to get back to you. I'll, I'll pull the staff and find out if anybody is aware of that activity. Okay. Because um, one of the things that does concern me about the potential rule is if, in fact, we are uh, we're leveraging the performance standard in the toy uh, in the toy arena, and then that effect that rule does change. That perhaps the uh, efficacy of using that performance standard may become in question. And I don't know if the staff had considered any flexibility language akin to what's involved in some of the 963 languages that allow for some uh, changes in 963 with regards to how the agency relies upon it as a mandatory rule. Has that been considered uh, alone or is there just total and complete confidence in that performance standard uh, being the performance standard to completely and as we state 100 percent mitigate any related injuries or deaths caused by these particular, by the, by the products under the scope of the rule? Certainly staff's opinion is that uh, the toy standard is the most expedient way to get the vast majority of these injuries that are occurring. So we, we're comfortable relying on the precedent set by the toy standard at this time. Given new information, we could reevaluate. And I would note that in the, the, the briefing package, um, our engineering sciences uh, uh, group um, s sampled and, and tested and measured the flux index of virtually all uh, magnet sets in the in the market at one time, <clears throat> and I believe 
the, the very weakest magnets that they came across were in the two, maybe 200 flux range, all the way up to multiples of that. And uh, they were fairly confident in concluding that there are no magnets that would uh, um, be considered magnet sets uh, that are anything close to that 50 uh, flux um, limit that's placed in, the, that, that appears in the, the draft final rule. Thank you very much. I have no further questions. Thank you, Commissioner Mororovic, and thank you for your kind words, uh, as well as the comments about former Chairman Tenenbaum. I have a feeling I'm going to be getting a call from a South Carolina area code wondering why I didn't say anything. Um, <laughs> during your presentation, Dr. Midget, you talked about how post the issuance of the notice of proposed rulemaking, the numbers have continued. The incident reports have continued. And then in response to Commissioner Robinson's question, you talked about the Office of Compliance believing that actions taken to date were not sufficient going forward. Could you explain a little bit more, please, about what the state of play with the reporting of incidents has been since the notice of proposed rulemaking and what your thoughts are on what that means going forward and the necessity or lack thereof of this proposed rule? Uh, given the data that we have, it's difficult to uh, ascertain rates of injury in the, the U.S. population. We, we just have numbers coming in, so the number of injuries uh, continues to grow since we uh, institute, since we proposed uh, the rule back in 2012. We've continued to receive injuries, uh, injury reports, and as those numbers grow, so does um, my concern that we really need to do something. Uh, and. Uh, since it's so easy for manufacturers to uh, buy bulk magnets and repackage them, um, the compliance activities so far have been a good start, but they're only just a start, and we won't, won't really be able to rest easily until there's a rule in place covering this product category, and that's my opinion. And historically, with injury reporting patterns, how many years out does it take for staff to get a confidence to become confident that enough years have passed for those numbers for prior years will remain static. Yeah, I'm not. Sh I'm not aware of uh, any set number that we are comfortable that we've we've gathered all the information that there is to gather. As I understand it, we get uh, uh, data points coming in from several years ago regularly, so that uh, previous analyses are are often modified by new information that, are, that arrives at, at any given time. For instance, we purchase um, uh, coroner's reports, medical examiner reports from the states, and sometimes those don't come in until years later. So our numbers for 2009 could still increase even in 2014. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Adler? Uh, thank you very much, uh, and I did want to also extend a thanks to our colleague, uh, Mr. Mohorovic, uh, for being a man of good cheer and wisdom, and it's a delight to work with you, and I look forward to doing that in future years. Um, I wanted to ask about magnetized jewelry. Um, I s ran across an article yesterday when I was preparing for the meeting today in which uh, I think it was in 2007 the Commission had actually issued a warning about magnetized jewelry being used as uh, faux tongue piercing, nose piercing, mouth piercing, uh, and we were getting some incidents uh, which I gather were dwarfed uh, <coughs> in the next year or so when buckyballs and other magnet sets were sold. And I also noticed that in the uh, injury data we have a very small number but a persistent number of jewelry ingestions. Uh, am I correct in saying that somebody who's actually marketing magnetized jewelry as magnetized jewelry, but marketing it as fake tongue piercing, mouth piercing, nose piercing, would not be covered by this rule? Am I correct in saying that? That's correct. Uh, and I also noted in, uh, I think it was a, a midget memo, that Australia actually has extended uh, their uh, regulation of magnets. I think it's if it's been into, uh, marketed or promoted as jewelry to be worn in or around the mouth or nose uh, as covered by their regulation. And I was curious, uh, is it just that the number of jewelry incidents that we know about are so small that we decided not to include them in the rule? Uh, is it your sense that uh, jewelry, the magnetized jewelry, will just not present a serious enough hazard in the future 
to be covered by this standard? It's a valid question. Uh, jewelry uh, has standards, uh, voluntary standards already in place covering that product category. And when we framed the notice of proposed rulemaking, our main concern was to get at the, the definitive cause of these injuries. And while it would have been possibly uh, an, a good idea to include other product categories, it would have slowed down the analysis and the discussion and, and perhaps not really have been required if the voluntary standard is effective in that product category. Um, we chose the path of expediency. We want to get something in place to cover what we know is hurting kids right now. Well, my middle name is Expediency, <laughs> so I fully endorse that as an approach. But I do hope, and I, I'm quite certain, that you will be monitoring the marketplace to see that when these high-powered magnet sets are off the market, that uh, kids who want to have these faux tongue uh, piercings don't turn to uh, the kinds of uh, magnetized jewelry that might present a hazard. And I hope the voluntary standard addresses that. I'm certainly with you on that. Um, I also had uh, one other question that it's just sort of puzzled me, and I'm not sure I can even uh, yeah, uh, if you were to look at the injury estimates on page 71, and I apologize, I should have just called you up and asked you this, but I got you on the hot seat, so I'm going to ask you now. It's on page 71, and it says, uh, just over half of the magnet cases from the emergency departments of the hospitals that <coughs> comprise the knife sample appear to involve the ingestion of more than one magnet. And I found that puzzling. Were we getting a number of reports from nice hospitals of ingestions of magnets that were just an ingestion of one magnet? I'll defer to Sarah Garland to answer okay. that question and again. were those like refrigerator magnets or big magnets that uh, might be a choking hazard or a digestion hazard but not a magnetic hazard? We have for the, for the NPR analysis that um, looked at the wording that was in the NICE narrative to see how many uh, magnets might have been swallowed. And so that um, in that analysis that uh, we have. I didn't make, intend to make this a pop quiz. <laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs> <laughs> that um, for, uh, for that one, this, yes, we had a, the majority of them were in the one magnet category that where they just described it as swallowed a magnet or swallowed one magnet, whereas we had other ones where they said yeah. that they swallowed two or seven or are just magnets, and so they were placed in more than one magnet category. Okay, that that's, I, I found that very interesting, and maybe it leads nowhere. Uh, and I guess that those, those are my questions for the moment again. Thank you. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would just like to preface this uh, next question with some uh, testimony that's part of the public record from the hearing back in October. Um, when the pediatric gastroenterologist came in to testify before us. And Dr. Ian Leibowitz, who was director of Pediatric Digestive Disease Center at Inova Fairfax Hospital, testified that uh, more than 100,000 foreign body ingestions occur each year, mostly in children. 10 to 20 percent of non-high-powered magnet ingestions require endoscopic removal. Less than 1 percent require surgical intervention. However, with high-powered magnet ingestions, 80 percent of them need intervention and 20 percent need significant surgery. And so I guess I'd just like to, to follow up Dr. Midget with um, Commissioner Mohorovic's um, questions about these flux index. And I think you mentioned, Mr. Cameros, that the, uh, Cameros, that, um, the, the um, flux index for the ones that we're concerned with are over 200. My understanding is some of them are as high as 400. Um, so I guess following up on that, on that preface, I, could you explain to us how swallowing uh, a magnet that's 50 versus and, and the injury that might occur or not occur versus the injuries with these high-powered magnets differ? Uh, a lower flux index magnet is most likely going to be a smaller magnet, and it's most likely going to uh, have a, a smaller reach of attraction. So the magnetic field, if you can picture it emanating from the magnet itself, won't be as big with a 50 flux index magnet as it would be 
with a 200 flux index magnet. A 200 or a 300 flux index magnet can find another magnet over several centimeters. So those really weak magnets, in order to attract together to one another, have to be much closer together in, in space. And so uh, then once they are attracted together, it takes less force to pull them apart. When the 200 or 400 flux magnets get together, you have to yank them apart. Once they're affixed, they're not coming undone in the intestines. And in terms of the, of the long-term injuries that can result, I happen, frankly, to be very familiar with this, having tried a case for someone who suffered from um, uh, short gut syndrome after a majority of the bowel being removed. And th this, so I'm very familiar with it, but I'd just like you to explain how these injuries that can result from these magnets, the high-powered magnets, are different than the ones with the lower flux index. Well, I, I, I'm extrapolating, but I believe the higher flux index is going to create an injury faster because it's going to um, press the intestines tighter, uh, and they're, they're also larger, so you might have a larger footprint for injury to occur uh, than, than with a much weaker magnet. And when we talk about injury, we're talking about cutting off blood flow to the intestine? That's right. Which can lead to bowel death? That's right. So the blood flow, once it's cut off, the the tissue dies, and then that can lead to a perforation. Thank you. I have nothing further. Commissioner Mohorovic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, forgive me, forgive me, Greg, there's a couple other questions I had with regards to the cost-benefit analysis I didn't think I'd have time for <laughs> in uh, my previous uh, set of questions. I wanted to get to the overall determination of the total cost. And as the pack package demonstrates that the total cost is the combination of loss producer surplus uh, along with lost use value. Um, and I think the package does demonstrate that um, we, we have tried but have failed to be able to put anything in terms of a monetary estimate behind the, uh, the lost use value. And my concern is that uh, while this is uh, one of the requirements in terms of uh, our Section 9 rulemaking, as stated earlier, uh, to ensure that the costs bear a reasonable relationship uh, to the benefits, um, that if our cost-benefit analysis comes into question, then one might be able to question the validity of the rule itself. Would you mind for uh, anybody, for myself and for anybody else interested in, in this particular aspect of the rulemaking, uh, to extrapolate a bit on uh, the determination of uh, lost utility and why um, uh, with every great effort, it wasn't something that we were able to determine f for this package. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> when an economist talks about use value or utility, what they're usually referring to is how much a consumer is willing and able to pay for a product. Uh, that is kind of our definition of what, what value means, and that value can for discussion purposes, be broken into a couple different components. One is what the consumer actually pays for the product. And so in the case of magnets, the average price was about $25. So a consumer pays the market, you know, a consumer, no matter how badly they want the magnets, they're going to pay the market price. And so they'll pay $25 for a set. And uh, that's, in a sense, kind of a... a you, you can say then that at, at a very minimum, they're placing a value of about $25 on this magnet set. But in addition to that, uh, we also know that consumers are usually willing to pay more than they actually did pay. And you may think back to your uh, introductory economics course, and we had downward sloping supply uh, demand curves, uh, meaning that as the price declines, the quantity demanded rises. Well, in a market, everybody pl pays that market price, the $25. But everybody who buys the magnet set at 25 probably would have been willing to pay a higher amount. Some might have been willing to pay $26. Some might have been willing to pay 35 Some might have been willing to pay $50. Uh, but we don't know what that number is. And that's, we call that consumer surplus. And so if, for example, uh, a magnet set costs $25, but we know that this individual consumer would have been willing to pay $35 for it, uh, then we would say the value to that consumer is about $35 for the set. Uh, now, 
if you're going to take the product away from the consumer so they can't buy it anymore, which we do with this rule, uh, they're going to have the $25 that they couldn't spend on the magnet set. So what they're really going to lose is what we call that consumer surplus, that amount over and above what they actually had to pay for it. I mean, that consumer surplus represents kind of a benefit that a consumer doesn't actually have to pay for. Uh, that's going to be the real loss uh, with this type of rule. Now, unfortunately, I mean, if we knew the shape of the demand curve, we'd be able to calculate what that number is. But we really don't know the shape. Uh, uh, and that's why, that's why we can't calculate what the actual consumer loss would be. Now, I, you, can, you can come up with some examples. I mean, you could, uh, in the uh, uh, regulatory analysis, we said, as an example, if on average all consumers who bought the magnets for $25 had been willing to pay $35, then the aggregate consumer surplus would be the t 10 extra dollars times sales, which was about 800000 or about $8 million. So if you believe that on average someone's going to get $10 of additional utility out of the product than what they had to pay for it, then you could calculate a, a, an estimate of the consumer surplus. Unfortunately, we have no basis for that. We don't know whether the average increase that consumers would pay would be $5, $10, or $15. So we know it's not zero. We know it's greater than zero, uh, but we really can't quantify it. And so all we can really do is, is, is discuss it. Uh, and we did that the best we could. I appreciate that and thank you. Have we looked at other examples where uh, other rulemakings have required the same, but yet um, uh, there's been that same difficulty in being able to come up with a good uh, estimation of the lost use, use value? Well, ordinarily, this kind of, this lost consumer utility is not an important aspect of the regulatory analysis. When we're looking at a more normal rule that just changes the product a little bit to make it a little bit more safe, safer and increases its price, but the product is still available to consumers, then we'd look at costs as, you know, we'd say, well, the cost increase was $5 Incremental to make it safer, costs, yeah. and we'd multiply that $5 times the number of products, and that would be our estimate of, 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 of what uh, the cost of the, of the rule would be. In this case, since we're eliminating the product from the marketplace, that it doesn't work, I mean, we can't look at it that way. So we have, to, we have to change our point of view to think about what the loss in consumer utility is and what the loss in producer uh, surplus is. And producer surplus is essentially just profits, you can think of it that way. Uh, but we ordinarily don't go into an analysis of losses in consumer surplus or producer surplus, uh, partly because the increases in price are usually relatively minor, and so you aren't going to have much of an impact on consumer surplus. So does that answer kind of your question? It does very much. I mean, especially the point that you mentioned how this rulemaking in particular is a bit different with some traditional uh, approaches uh, for other rulemakings, whether CPSC or otherwise. So I appreciate that very much. I apologize for asking to come back on point on the same subject. Uh, so I apologize, commissioners, but I paid my full fare, so I'm going to get to go on all the rides on the amusement park today. So that concludes. I have no further questions. Thank you. Commissioner Adler, I believe you have one more question. Yeah, and it's on the same point. Don't go away. <laughs> because the one thing you didn't mention is what I would call consumer deficit. Namely, I bought it for 25 bucks, and I say it's a piece of crap, uh, and I don't like it. And so I'm sure that there is a an unmeasurable number of people out there, but that would be something that I would also include in a calculation. Um, but the, the, on a more serious point, uh, in picking up on Commissioner Mohorovic's uh, point, I, first of all, I thought the economic analysis was really quite good, and I personally think it sells it short to say that the lost utility cannot be measured. I think it cannot be measured with precision, but it does seem to me you get a pretty good range. Uh, you can say, using a hypothetical and based on data that you already have, that the consumer surplus is very unlikely to rise above X uh, or unlikely to fall below X. And if you were to 
calculate that in, to me using as sort of your baseline what consumers actually paid for it that I don't understand why we couldn't give a range of uh, that of the consumer lost consumer utility and the reason I say that is because almost any scenario I could imagine I did a little bit of calculation the cost benefit ratio is still so positive that this rule is easily justifiable so I think that might address some of the concerns that have been raised because it just seems in a sense dismissive <coughs> to say well we can't measure it but in fact I think you actually did a better job than you're giving yourself credit well, for. Uh, uh, I mean we could you could look at it a little bit differently and, th and think how much consumer surplus would you have to lose to make the benefits less than the costs and you could do that I mean if we take as a given the 28.6 million and the uh, producer surplus loss of six million, which, you know, those are approximations. They aren't exact, exact. But if we take them, uh, the difference between those is uh, uh, about uh, about twenty three million. Now, if you doubled the price of the magnet set from twenty twenty five dollars to fifty dollars, and we could say that consumers would have been willing to pay fifty dollars for it. Then the con then the benefits would approximately equal the costs. So you could say so if you think that it's outrageous that anybody'd be willing to spend fifty dollars for this product, then you might conclude, given the other assumptions we've made in the analysis, that the benefits are greater than the costs. Uh, if you think that people would have been willing to pay one hundred and twenty five dollars for these, then 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 you can't you can't say that, but. You can do these what if. Uh, uh well, I think you actually even have better data than that because I assume somebody who's a profit seeking entrepreneur is going to do his or her best to figure out what that demand curve is and to pretty much calculate that uh, maybe $25 uh, gets me there, and if I raise it $5 more, I'm probably going to lose overall revenue. So it seems to me that if you believe in all the economic models we were taught when we were taking introductory economics that uh, you could say that uh, that this the, the actual price fairly approximates the optimal uh, pricing number for the product but or at least with some variation I guess I I'll just repeat what I'm saying I think we actually have more useful data and I think you did a better job than I hear you giving yourself credit for okay well I would still say that 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 we can't really quantify what the loss in consumer surplus is. Uh, uh, I agree, ahead. but you could give a range, and that, that's all I'm saying. So, uh, but I'm sorry, I interrupted you, and I apologize for that. Well, I guess I, I guess I, I don't really have anything else to add. But if you want to talk about this some more, I'll be I'll be around. It's interesting stuff. Thank you very much, Commissioner Robinson. I have nothing further. Thank you, Commissioner Mohorovic. This concludes the commissioner's questions and. With that, I would like to thank the staff who participated today, Dr. Garland, Mr. Camaros, Dr. Midget, Dr. Rogers, and with that, <coughs> this concludes this public meeting of the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission.